This reading is from Rays of the One Light by Swami Kriyananda. We're on week number 16, and the topic is to each according to his faith. Truth is one, is e <coughs> truth is one and eternal. Realize oneness with it in your deathless self within. The following commentary is based on the teachings of Paramahansa Yogananda. In the Gospel of St. John, chapter 3, we read, Everyone that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. But he that doeth truth cometh to the light, that his deeds may be made manifest, that they are wrought in God. It is a common experience shared by most people that when a person errs, he experiences a desire to hide that error from his conscience instead of holding it up for purification. Error clutches its mis misdeeds to itself and resists correction, though it is only in the state of purity that we can achieve perfect freedom. It requires an act of will to offer that awareness to the light and to hold it there until one's inner darkness is completely dissipated. For in every state of consciousness, for every state of consciousness has its own attractive power, and the more we allow that attraction to act upon us, the more we attract to ourselves the objective circumstances and experiences natural to it. Our faith is the attractive power of our underlying state of consciousness. Goodness attracts goodness. It takes goodness even to see goodness. Evil attracts evil. And it takes evil even to see evil, that is, to take special note of its, its existence. Whatever there is in you of darkness or light, offer it up, offer it up to the heights. In the supreme light alone, we will find salvation. Accept nothing less in yourself as your lasting reality. 
As the Bhagavad Gita says in the 12th chapter, Cling thou to me, clasp me with heart and mind, so shalt thou dwell surely with me on high. But if thy thought droops from such heights, if thou beest weak to set body and soul upon me constantly, despair not, give me lower service, seek to reach me, worshiping with steadfast will. And if thou canst not worship steadfastly, work for me, toil in works pleasing to me, for he that laboreth right for love of me shall finally attain. But if in this thy faint heart fails thee, bring me thy failure. Thus through Holy Scripture, God has spoken to mankind. Om, Om, Om. I'd like to start this morning with a reading from Whispers of Eternity by Paramahansa Yogananda. <clears throat> Bless me that I may perceive thee through the windows of all joyous activities. Look upon me and cheer me always as I engage in my daily duties. Let my every action, whether waking, sleeping, or dreaming, be sprayed by the fountain of thy presence. So, I welcome this morning. Um, I think one of the things that's going on is we just had a graduation of YTT students. And I want to congratulate everybody who persevered through four weeks. And <laughs> <laughs> and um, also, I want to especially welcome anyone who's here for their first time today. It's a really special for us, hopefully it's special for you that you can go away and take uh, the inspiration of Ananda with you. We also have some sp uh, very special group of newcomers that I'm going to embarrass a little bit and ask to stand up. Um, the high school is uh, hosting a, an exchange this week with from a community, spiritual community in Quebec. So if our guests would stand up there. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, thank you. Later on, they're going to sing a little bit. They, they come from a, um, you can sit down. Asayez-vous. <laughs> 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 it's amazing. I haven't studied French for almost 50 years, and it's, it's starting to come back, <laughs> just being around them. <laughs> but um, I've asked them to sing uh, later on in the service. They come from a spiritual tradition. It comes out of Bulgaria. And um, it's a mystical tradition based on uh, Christ consciousness and inner awareness. And I, when I was visiting there, I was very struck by their music. It was very, very inspiring to listen to, even though, of course, I didn't understand a word being Bulgarian. Um, today, today's reading, when I was looking over, one of the lines struck me especially, and I thought I'd start off with that again. <coughs> Somebody s says in the middle of the reading, he says, Our faith is the attractive power of our underlying state of consciousness. Our faith is the attractive power of our underlying state of consciousness. <coughs> I'm, I, I'd never really thought about that. As usual with Swami, often he opens up a little another doorway that you hadn't quite thought about before. And I kind of had relaxed with the idea that faith was related to religion and kind of let it go at that. When I saw this, I what, what's he talking about? And I thought, oh, that's a deeper part. It's a deeper part of faith. I mean, true faith, true faith, in God uh, brings us in to, to uh, experience God's presence in our lives. But we could look around uh, outside of ourselves, but maybe inside of ourselves, and we see that there are other kinds of faith that we have that also create their own level of consciousness. And I was thinking a little bit about, uh, well, one thing I remember uh, struck me a long time ago. For about a year, I had a job as a postman, and I would go around and deliver mail. And for that one year of my life, 
I had an exquisite uh, sensitivity to, to, to mailboxes. <laughs> 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 and I noticed all their different shapes and colors and sizes, and, and I would appreciate very creative ones. And it was just like that was part of my world because that was where my faith was. My faith was uh, related to uh, being a mailman. I was uh, thinking of another situation um, because thieves have faith too. Um, I was on a bus in Rome once and I was trying out my Italian. I was trying to read a sign and I was kind of leaning over like this, looking at the side of the bus, reading it. It said, beware of pickpockets. <laughs> 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 and I, I thought, oh, that's interesting. And I got, got out of the bus the next block. My wallet's missing. <laughs> 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 and I imagine the fact that I was bending over reading the sign made it more <laughs> able to take it. <laughs> but I was thinking of that, that person, the pickpocket, you know, and his consciousness, his faith led him to be watching all these people on the bus to see who was in the best position to steal their, their wallet. You know, and you know, made one of the little things we've learned was that if there are people, you know, they would always pick very crowded buses because in a crowded bus, everybody's jammed up against each other and you're not aware of you know somebody touching you somebody's always touching you so they just you know and they practice they practice day and night for years and they get very very good at it so that kind of faith um has its power has a power to it now does it bring us to uh final uh realization final um en enlightenment Pro maybe well it's a step on the way <laughs> it's probably better than lying on the gutter <laughs> and drunk <laughs> so um maybe it's a step up but there are obviously many other steps to, to go and with us, um, we have a very special um, destiny, uh, being drawn to a path like this. It's, and later on, we're going to do the Festival of Light. And in, in there, it says the conversation uh, between Jesus and Babaji that started this whole work, where Jesus came and he said, the lights on the high altars of my church are growing dim. The lower lights, lower levels of good works, the lower candles of good works are shining brightly, but the higher noble taper of inner communion with the Lord burns low and is ill-attended. Well, that ties in here very, very clearly because in, when we're in our normal, st normal state of consciousness, I won't say normal, I'll say our, our initial state of consciousness, our sensory state of consciousness, our faith is in the senses. Our faith is where our energy goes. And so our energy goes out to the senses. That is our reality. That's what we measure life by. We measure ourselves by. <coughs> the, perhaps the highest you can get at that level is through good works. You can uh, become a good person. You can, you can help other people rather than robbing them. You can uh, tell the truth rather than telling lies. There are lots of things you can do at that level of consciousness. But it's all out through the senses. It's still a sensory reali reality. It's not the noble taper of inner communion that we've been given. And that noble taper is available to us now. Now, I was thinking about, I was, I'm a, I, for those of you who don't know me, I, I work in the schools here, um, mainly through the high school and the college. And so I get to spend a lot of time thinking more academically or uh, historically than a lot of people do. And I was thinking of that. Um, I'm not sure that meditation was all that available, um, say, 150, 200 years ago. Um, you look at the lives of the medieval saints, uh, St. Saint Francis, uh, a lot of the Christian saints, and more than you hear some idea of inner communion, but more you hear this idea of trying to get away from the body by, by being <laughs> uh, forceful with the body, by you know, using a chain whip or something on your back or just going through all these austerities. And that may have been the best way to get away from the body at that point. Maybe the consciousness on the planet was so low that people weren't capable of uh, attending to the noble taper. But we know that with um, Babaji meeting Lahiri back in 1860, we at least know on our path that a new wave has come onto the planet, a new, uh, new dispensation that now, again, meditation is possible. Meditation is a way. And what that does is it shifts the whole ballgame. It shifts us away out of the senses. Because in meditation, 
obviously, what do you do? You close your eyes. You try not to pay attention to what's the outer sounds. You try to sit still so you're not moving around. You're trying to still the senses. And what does that do? It opens up a new realm of experience for us. The uh, best metaphor I've ever come up across with was the idea of um, night vision. When you have been in a room that's brightly lit and you all of a sudden you run outside, you can't see a thing and you just, you're, you're lost and because you, have, you don't have, you can't see what's around you. You could panic. You could panic and start running around and trip over yourself and all kinds of things could happen to you. Or you could just wait and you could just relax and just say, no, there's something else here that I can tune into. And gradually we're created so that our night um, sense starts to come to the fore. And all of a sudden we can see better. Maybe some people can see better than others, but we can still see better than when we were in the light, in the bright lights. And meditation is so similar to that because when we first close off the senses, if we only have lived our lives through the senses, we're going to say, oh, what's going on here? <laughs> maybe we get confused. Maybe we get afraid. Maybe we just get bored. It's just because uh, not much is going on. And we can panic and we can say, ah, I've had enough of this and you run out the other way and go back to uh, whatever you uh, like to do, watch TV or uh, <laughs> stimulate the senses in other ways. So the trick is, just like with the night vision, just to stop and wait. And just let that other sense, that other level of awareness come to the fore in our, in our consciousness. And then we can start to become aware of the inner universe, the inner realms. And that's where the noble taper of inner communion starts to happen. It's a gradual process. At first, it, well, the first thing almost everybody has, I, I, I had it, I probably most of you had it. First thing is you start to realize that you probably, your mind is probably the most restless mind in the world. <laughs> And you kind of get a little sad about that, the fact that you know, some people can sit there and meditate, they look like they just boom, like that, and they're deep. And you're sitting there scrambling around in your head, li reliving the last you know, 24 hours of your life and from many different directions. Um, but it's so important to realize that that is just simply a stage. It's not a judgment of your mind. It's simply a stage of development that, yeah, you do have to sit there, and you do have to persevere, and you have to offer yourself into that direction. I, one of the things we do in high school here is we play a lot of volleyball. And um, when the young people come in about seventh grade, they're usually not very good at it. <laughs> and they, uh, they, the ball will come to them, and the first thing they'll do is just get one, maybe some people just stand there, and boom, <laughs> there's the ball. <laughs> there are other people, and I won't mention any names, that when the, <laughs> the ball comes to them, they scream and run the other way. <laughs> <laughs> but you watch, and it's amazing because, of course, the, the people stay in school year after year, and by the time these people are, you know, freshmen, sophomores, juniors, they're amazing. They start to smash the ball, and, you know, other people, people are coming in and saying, wow, they're really good players. And in the back of my mind, I remember, well, I remember when they used to run away from the ball, <laughs> but now they're up there jumping over the net and spiking it, and... Uh, <laughs> It's just, uh, it happens, you know, progress happens. And you, that you can take any other skill that we might take up, uh, knitting or something. And you just see, yeah, at the beginning, it doesn't go very well. But if you stay with it, it gets, you start to get the hang of it. It's humanly possible to accomplish almost anything. Well, with meditation, that should give us the uh, reassurance that it will come, it will come in time. It does take practice, but Many, many people have taken it far enough so that meditation becomes a very, very enriching, fruitful part of their lives. And if all it takes is to hang in there with it. It just takes us to practice. Maybe we don't practice for an hour at a time at the beginning. Maybe all we can do is 10 minutes. But if, as long as we stay with it, it'll, it'll, we will start to make that, that inner world become awakened to us. This inner world is so important because it's the only place where we're really going to find the fulfillment we're looking for. There's simply nothing outwardly that is ever going to satisfy us permanently. It's simply, it's, the creation is not set up that way. You take extremes like, um, like Michael Jordan's one of my favorite people to think about. Michael Jordan, for those of you who aren't basketball players, or, um, he's probably the best basketball player on the planet uh, ever. Incredibly skilled, incredibly coordinated. <coughs> And he won, I think it was two, wor two world championships uh, with his team. And what did he do? He retired <laughs> because it wasn't 
<laughs> fulfilling enough for him at that point. He went to play baseball, of all things. And he turned out to be a very mediocre baseball player. He, just <laughs> he was just you know, very average. But he kind of did it for a couple of years. And then he decided to go back, and he won a couple more championships with in basketball. But it was, just, it was just such a statement that you know, even being the best basketball player on the planet wasn't completely fulfilling to him. And we've heard stories about wealth, you know, really rich people. Uh, Swami tells a story about, uh, I think it's Howard Hughes, being uh, the richest man in the world back in the 60s, being interviewed just before he died. And they asked him, are you happy? And he says, nah, I, I couldn't say I'm happy. <laughs> and you take uh, the Beatles, you know, inc what, what incredible fame karma. Just pow, there they are with millions of fans. And did it make him happy? Yeah, I don't think so. <laughs> it just seemed like they kind of got tired of it and uh, you know, had to try to move on. So we know if we look at life, uh, we can see that these outward things don't, don't really work for us. One of the joys of teaching in school here is you get to work with these things with people so much earlier. You know, for me, I, rose, I was raised thinking that, yeah, you become a success outwardly. That's where it's all about. Become a, become a famous person or a rich person or whatever it is. And, you know, you have to stumble through your life in your 20s and 30s, and finally you might figure it out that maybe it's not going to work. Well, here people, people get to study these things when they're 14 and 15 years old. <laughs> we were just doing a, a, a series of things on what's called Shankya Yoga, Shankya philosophy, and just looking, studying people's lives, just to see, did it make, did it make uh, let's see, who are some of the people I, they picked? Michael Jackson. Did it take, didn't, was Michael Jackson a happy person? <laughs> Probably not. Um, and you can go along and look at other ones <coughs> that way. So it is through opening up these inner doors of consciousness that we actually have a chance to really finally realize and experience the level of fulfillment that is going to satisfy us permanently. We can see that, um, for example, I, I took a drastic example. I just got to go into a seclusion recently, and I took a series of little books in with me of people, different kinds of people, um, inspiring people and not so inspiring. The one I'm going to talk about right now is Adolf Hitler. It was a little <laughs> funny book to take into seclusion. <laughs> 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 but it was fascinating because, uh, you know, when you see somebody like Adolf Hitler, he, he basically takes to an extreme what a lot of us try to do in a less extreme way. His, his whole focus in life was to impose his will on, on the outward conditions around him. He had incredible willpower, incredible will. He was a total failure for the first 25, 30 years of his life. Nothing worked for him, but he didn't let it get him down. You know, some of us would give up and say, ah, you know, I can't do anything. He just said, I'm, I am, my, mein Kampf, my struggle. That was his, what his book was about. And he just kept doing it. He kept putting out his will, kept trying. And he found himself in a situation that was very ripe for his kind of energy. He found himself in a country, Germany, which was totally devastated. Completely, people were completely poor, in poverty, the country wasn't functioning, people, just everything was in disaster. And his powerful will was very magnetic. People wanted, we want to believe in ourselves, they wanted to follow him. So he just kept going, he kept going, he became the, you know, the, the head of the country. He started the World War II, he invaded all these countries, he expanded Germany, I don't know, three or four times its size uh, just by conquests of different sizes. And he was very successful for about 10 years. And then things started to not work so well. <laughs> you know, he started to make a little couple mistakes. Uh, he, ma he made the mistake of invading uh, Russia in, in th uh, the autumn, <laughs> which is kind of stupid if you stop it. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, there was a veil over his brain and... Uh, uh, found out that eventually, of course, his troops got, most of them froze, <laughs> and the rest of them got defeated. Uh, he just split his armies. One went one way, one went the other way. So anyway, just s these mistakes inevitably came in because his will, no matter how strong, was not the will of the universe. And inev inevitably, that will was going to run into other, other m movements, other, other ways of being. Um, what, he, what happened to him was interesting because he basically... He started to throw tantrums, just like a little kid. And a little kid can't get the popsicle that it wants and starts to say, I want that popsicle. And uh, the dad says, no, you can't have that. Ah! And he starts screaming and yelling. Well, you know, Hitler started to do this toward the end of his life. He just started, they've said he had apoplexy, which he would just get so frustrated because things weren't going the way he wanted them to do. He would just turn purple and start, you know, uh, having a, like a seizure practically. 
So it's kind of like, again, an extreme way. Well, what does that teach us? It teaches us that we probably should work on something other than our will <laughs> if we want to find happiness in life. Because when we, when we in our own way, we're all, we, we have our, our idea of what we want to happen. And if we're not open to a higher reality, we're not open to, to divine will, God's will, we're not trying to tune ourselves to God's will, we're just going to create frustration for us, ourselves. And we're going to have temper tantrums <laughs> of one sort or another. They might not be outward temper tantrums that other people can see, but they'll be inner ones that we have to experience and go through. There is a higher reality. There is a higher reality. There's a divine will in life. And when we attune our will to that will, then we just, we, there's just this incredible perfection of consciousness that happens. And all the saints manifest this. All the saints from all the traditions manifest this this reality of uh, having learned how to attune their, their will to a higher will. How do you do that? Well, you have to develop meditation skills. You have to learn how to listen inwardly, how to feel that vibration, that flow of energy through your body, your mind, your consciousness, and learn how to rest in that and basically turn life over to God. God has the plan that we want to, to manifest. We may not understand it. Um, sometimes it's very, very difficult from the outside to understand what in the heck is going on. I think uh, Jesus is maybe one of the ultimate examples of that. Jesus had turned his life over to God completely. <coughs> and what happened? He got scourged, he got spit at, he got crucified. Did he argue with that? Did he say, hey, wait a minute, this is not working? <laughs> <laughs> <coughs> his, w his faith was so great, his, his attunement was so great that he just said, Thy will, not mine, be done. And it looked like a total failure, a total disaster. His life was a total disaster. He'd have been teaching for three years. He had a few disciples, and the whole thing was just going to be just wiped off the face of the planet because he was being crucified. But for him, he said, that's okay. <laughs> Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And just allowed himself to participate in the role that God had given him. And what happened? Well, we have 2,000 years of Christianity <laughs> since that time that swept the whole, most of the continent, most of the planet, um, because there was a bigger plan at work. There was a divine will that was more, that was bigger than the, the sensory input that was happening at that particular moment when he was being persecuted and crucified. So we have to develop, and that's where faith, real, the highest level of faith comes in, that faith where our consciousness is so attuned to the divine that we don't question anymore. We, we are happy with what happens on a planet. Uh, we're, we're okay the fact that maybe there's wars happening. Well, there's a reason for those wars. There, because when from the divine point of view, there's really only one thing happening on this whole creation, and it's the awakening of souls to higher and higher consciousness. And God, that's all that God really cares about. He doesn't care how many lifetimes it takes for you or how many people get killed. Was it one <laughs> of Swami's very curt comments <laughs> recently was, God swallows people <laughs> or something like that. <laughs> it's not a, it's a very, you know, if you're thinking of this is your only life, you might have a hard time with that one. But if you, <laughs> <laughs> if you think of yourself as a soul unfolding through the ages and through the incarnations, then you, you're okay with that. You're okay with, okay, That's, uh, this is this big, this big drama, this big awakening of everybody. Yeah, we're a planet. We're a planet that has a lot of lessons to it. It's a very, very special place to grow because the dark is so strong and the light is strong, both. You have a kind of a balance of the two. So it's very easy to see both at work in, this, in, our, in our lives. We can learn how to attune ourselves with the light and to stay away from the dark. But th if we all get upset because the dark is happening, then that all just boxes us in. We get upset in our own emotions. And the whole idea is to get free and to learn to just accept. It doesn't mean you accept with callousness, the, the fact that somebody's being killed, you're, you, you want to, your uh, heart wants to go out and to support that soul as it goes through the different changes it's going through. But it's not a reason for, to, for pessimism or uh, despair on our part. No, everything has its own place. Everything has its own time. Everything has its own rhythm. I wanted to close with a saying that comes from the Buddha, which I came across recently, which kind of captures this whole attunement with the divine. He said that once you realize, it has to go through, once you realize how everything works, 
you will throw your head back and laugh at the sky. <laughs> oh, are you on top side? <laughs>